I have to wait until I get the nod from Jamie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Cute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, no clipboard. All right, uh, good morning, my name is Alex Jules. I'm the executive director for the Fellowship of Free Thought. Thank you for coming out this very wet September 16th, uh, Sunday. We have a uh, somewhat truncated gathering today. Uh, we have a lot of our colleagues, friends, and families heading out to the Pride Parade, um, which actually starts in a couple of hours, and uh, I would recommend or encourage many of you, if you can come out there, it's supposed to let up a little bit um, around noon, so we, sh we won't necessarily be walking um, in the rain, and it's gonna be about 75 degrees out there today. Last year, it was just wonderful. We had about 100, 150 people from the core out there, and we had all three of the banners um, uh, uh, represented, Metroplex Atheist, ours, um, the fellowship and the DFW core. So if you can make it, please do. Um, just a couple of notes before we get started. Let's see. If, if you haven't seen Kevin Kirkland, you know, it, if, if the next time he's here, try and find him and then try and find the rest of him if you can. Um, let's see, I also wanted to congratulate one of our longtime members, uh, Will Fortin, uh, who last month graduated from OCS. Uh, yeah. He, yeah. Uh, Ensign Fortin and family will be relocating to the uh, Charlotte uh, area, I guess it is in a couple of weeks now. Um, they did get the, uh, their housing approved, so they will be out there shortly, so get your goodbyes <laughs> in now. Um, but I'm very proud of them. Uh, let's see. Also, I wanted to uh, start off by thanking the... Uh, so many of our volunteers, Melanie, Tammy, Anne, Amanda, et cetera, for what was just a phenomenal, phenomenal um, Women of Reason, Feminine Faces of Free Thought event yesterday. Uh, we had a wonderful turnout. Um, it was just nice to see so many. And as just a free thinker who happens to be male, the, I, I was very, very pleased. It was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, a little bit of a, a note uh, for those that do not, uh, that aren't heading to the uh, parade, uh, you can meet with Justin and Tammy later on, um, you know, right after they're going to go ahead and do lunch. Um, if you want to, you know, take the opportunity to do that and, and still do a gathering of, of some sort. We don't have a potluck today. Um, and also, uh, another good uh, note is September 22nd, we have youth paintball that is scheduled. Uh, small correction, uh, it is going to be at Gatsplat, not Panera. <laughs> not Panera in Louisville. Um, uh, if we get as many kids as, as we're hoping that will turn out, it should be, a, thank you very much. Uh, it, it should be a really cool event. Let the kids have a little bit of fun, all right? Okay. Um, all right, so today we have a special speaker, uh, the former Florida State Director for American Atheists, who served from October 2011 until May of 2012. She was the Deputy VP of Outreach and Administration for the National Atheist Party, NAP. Um, she also served as the Women's Committee Chair and sat on various other committees, including fundraising, political strategy, and public relations. She's also been an intern for the Foundation for Beyond Belief. Side note, we are this close to helping the foundation get that $20,000 grant. So if you can get on your smartphones or find, an, a, find your nearest internet terminal, um, get on there and, and vote. There, as of last night, there were 96 votes away from that grant. So get on Facebook. It's a click away, and it, it goes to support a good cause. And share it. <clears throat> and share it. Exactly. We've got 40 people that are supposed to be here today. Um, share. We can, we can bridge that gap. We can make it happen. All right. 
It, it is, um, if you go on to any single, it, Zach's page, my page, I think we have it on Fellowship of Free Thought Dallas as well. We have links there. I mean, we've been sharing this one like crazy. Okay. All right. Back to Bridget. Sorry. Um, all right. So she's also been an intern for Foundation for Beyond Belief in their Members and Partners program and a member of Orlando Free Thinkers and Humanists, Black Nonbelievers of uh, Metro Orlando, Humanists of Florida Association, amongst others. Um, though raised a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness, biblical literist and, and young earth creationist. Isn't that somewhat synonymous? I mean, Jehovah's Witness and biblical literacy. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, Bridget comes to the movement through education. Uh, she's currently a medical case manager focusing on HIV positive women who are pregnant. In her spare time, <laughs> she sleeps. No, in her spare time. <laughs> Uh, she's an avid reader and gamer. Bridget blogs about atheism and related topics at emilyhasbooks.com. Please help me welcome Bridget Carter. Good morning, everyone. Like Alex said, I am the, my current position is the Deputy VP of Outreach for Secular Woman. And there's our beautiful logo. And I just have a little intro video for you, if it works like I want it to. Nope, it's not. <laughs> um, I'll, maybe I'll come back to that. OK, so we'll start with me. Um, that's little Bridget, about <laughs> six months old. And yeah, cute. So I was a child of the 80s back when Michael Jackson was still fairly normal. Um, <laughs> Teddy Ruxpin, some of the favorites. I think I'm older than quite a few of you, so the hairstyles were great, but yeah, that was my childhood. But what I really wanna get into that kinda helps you understand me and how I got to this point, I was raised a Joe's Witness. For the people that don't know too much about them, um, we're the ones that come knocking on your doors on Saturday morning, wanting to give you the watchtower. Um, they don't celebrate birthdays, no Christmas, no fun, basically. Um, you can only be friends with people that are Jehovah's Witnesses, and when I get later in my story, you'll understand why this is important. Although I went to public school, I couldn't even, I wasn't even allowed to play with like the neighbor kids that live next door because they weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. They felt that pretty much anybody was bad association and they considered worldly a bad term. Mostly we, now we think that's a very worldly person, that's good for them, bad. It was a very high control group. Um, they had lots of rules and you could get like kicked out and shunned for the smallest offense like smoking a cigarette. And yes, we were young earth creationists. I firmly believed until age 22 that the earth was 6,000 years old, that we all sprung forth from Adam and Eve. I thought the evolution was a joke. I didn't understand it, obviously. And yeah, that's how I was raised. My parents were very devout. My mother was what you call a regular pioneer, where she dedicates like 150 hours of going door to door work. That was her full time job. She was, women were, tend to be expected to stay at home. I was raised to do domestic things. I was supposed to be a wife and mother. School was never, they never cared about it. I, made, I was a straight A student, but college was never brought up because I was supposed to get married when I was 18 and have lots of kids and stay at home. So, um, let's see. Fast forward to 2000, that was my upbringing. In 2000, I was about 22. Two things, really big things happened that year. One, my libido. So I, w I wanted a boyfriend really bad and I started school. So, hi, are you gonna come help me? <laughs> so I started Wichita State University and that is where I met one of the first guys I dated happened to be an atheist, but that was no problem because I was gonna convert him. I was Jehovah's Witness. I knew how to you know, break it down and convince anybody that I was right. So we took a couple classes together, biological anthropology. 
it was completely eye-opening. I finally, for the first time, understood evolution. And you know what? It wasn't that complicated. The way I was raised, I mean, you know, the most ignorant stuff, you know, if, why do we still have monkeys if there was evolution? You know, if they gave birth to humans. I mean, like, that's what I was thinking 10 years ago. It, it amazes me that I had that kind of mentality. The other thing, the class that completely changed my mind, it blew my mind, was geology, which I never had an interest in. But I'm sure most of you know about Pangaea. That's when all the continents were all stuck together millions of years ago. And now you can actually see when you put them together that they fit. And the geology teacher simply explained, we know how much the continents are moving every year, you know, so many millimeters, whatever. And it would have taken this many millions of years for them to move apart. And I'm like, okay. So the whole 6,000 years, totally blown out of the water. And I was, from that moment on, I was hooked. I, I remember too, there was a guy in the, in the class who always brought his Bible and he sat in the front of the class and it was a huge Bible and he always wanted to argue with the teacher, but it actually really helped me you know, become an atheist. So I, I should find that guy someday and thank him for bringing his Bible every day. <laughs> but let me see. I remember what I have next. Okay, so that was, like I said, 10 years ago. And that's, I considered myself an agnostic for the next 10 years. I didn't believe in the Bible. I felt like that had been disproved pretty well, but I still had that feeling, you know, there's something bigger out there. There's something, something more. There's got to be. I had that feeling. I prayed a little bit, but then what happened? I started reading. I read a Brief History of Time, to this day, is my favorite book. It explains, you know, as best as he knew at the time, how the universe possibly started. I learned about the Big Bang and cosmology, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris. This was all, all of these were fairly recently toward the end of my journey. And I was doing all good. Oh, one thing I didn't mention was the guy that I was dating the atheist, also a white guy, by the way. I'm going to point that out because my family was, my mother's born in Mississippi. Anyway, whole big thing there. But I got found, I was dating him secretly. I got found out and I was disfellowshipped. And what that means is, you know, I was excommunicated, cut off from everyone. Anyone that was a Jehovah's Witness at that point was no longer allowed to talk to me. So this is, you know, six million people you know, around the world, <laughs> no longer can talk to me. And if you remember, my only friends, the only people I knew were Joe's witnesses that I could associate with. So in one fell swoop, I lost my entire family, all my friends. And that was about 12 years ago. I've talked to my father once since then. My brother, my older brother, I haven't at all. My younger brother, a couple times. My mother calls every six months to make sure that I don't want to come back to Jesus. So, or I do want to, she's trying to make sure and get me to come back. So this 10 year journey was excruciating. I had no family. I had my husband, but he was right. He was always an atheist. So it never, he didn't really understand that transition that I made the pain that, you know, losing my family and everything. So after my 10 years, I, you know, I read a lot of books, but I'm still like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's more. So I thought, I'm going to give God one more chance. I read this book, A Case for Christ. I started going to church. This is after 10 years of being an agnostic and knowing everything that I knew. I went to a Catholic church, I went to a mosque, I went to a temple. I, every religious friend that I had that was you know, fairly intelligent, we had long conversations. And this was over the course of a year. And I prayed really, really hard. And guess what happened? <laughs> Nothing. So I'm like, okay, done. Soon after that, what do I see driving down the street? This billboard. Don't believe in God, you are not alone. That was huge for me. So I'm, I've been a big advocate of billboards. They get a lot of flack. A lot of people think, oh, whatever. But this got me to come out of the closet. This billboard right here. I had never, 
aside from my husband, really met any other atheists either. So it was weird. I had never been able to talk openly about it. But as soon as I, I actually almost crashed in my car because I, I was typing in the address to find the cycle. I'm like, I can't, I can't forget this. And I found the coordinator and I met, they had a group meeting like the next day. I went to Panera Bread and there was a room full of atheists and it was so weird. I actually felt kind of like, creepy because in my mind I had been raised to think that atheists were the most evil people devil worshippers and and I'm now in a room full of them but then after a few minutes it just became the most refreshing experience of my life to this day it was huge for me and we got to talk I mean I got to say out loud I don't believe in God to a room full of people in a public place it was it was crazy let's see a blank slide okay that kind of started my activism. I thought, I need to, you know, I've never met another black atheist, too. That was also huge for me. Um, I need to be out there letting people see my face. Um, I just want to be involved. I think a lot of people, when they kind of convert or deconvert, they just want to, like, jump right in there. And that was me. So I volunteered with the, Vol the National Atheist Party, United Corps. They're the ones that put up the billboard. So, of course, I wanted to do anything I could to help them. American Atheist, I was the state director, Foundation Bound Belief, I love. And one of the reasons why I want to intern with them is my master's focused on nonprofit management. I thought that this was a perfect mix of, you know, nonprofit management and secularism, you know, so. And that's me at my first protest. <laughs> so pretty proud of that. There was a six ton black granite 10 commandment mon monument put right in front of the courthouse in this little town in florida so it was just so in your face so i got you know it was like about f 15 of us that got together and protested of course it was like 200 of them that showed up counter protesters but it was really it took me back to my days when i believed in you know the young earth creationism. And I'm just like, this was me. And I, so I think that helped me deal with them a lot because everybody else was like screaming and yelling and like, no, that's so silly. But I'm like, no, I, I completely understand. And I you know, was talked to the people. It didn't really accomplish anything. But now American Atheists actually did file a lawsuit and they are fighting it. So hopefully that'll get taken down. So that brings me to where I am now, um, secular woman. Like I said, I was raised very, you're gonna be a mother, you're gonna do this and that, this is how a woman's supposed to act. And I guess at 32, I kind of found my rebellious stage, because I'm like, no, I am not gonna do that. And I'm really bad at how I was raised. I never mowed a lawn, I never changed a tire. I mean, like, I'm a strong woman, I can do these things. I can lead, maybe, we'll see. I have this degree, so I'm gonna use it to help women. A friend of mine, after the Women in Secularism Conference, came up with this idea for having a women's organization, and we were surprised that there, at this point, was no national women's organization. There was all kinds of, um, you know, secular women. There are, there's black atheist groups, there's LGBT, there's Latino, but there was no women's group. So we kind of took the temperature of about the top 15 organizations. We looked at their leadership numbers, their um, speakers bureaus, attendance uh, at conventions, speakers, stuff like that. And we noticed there is an obvious disparity in the male versus female in these positions. So there's been a lot of talk about why women aren't getting involved. They feel maybe unsafe or there's been various uh, reasons, but we're like, we're not gonna focus on the negative, we're gonna focus on the positive. So we, one of the first things we did, well actually let me, let me see what I have next. Let me go through the mission and vision, and then I'll get into those stuff. But the mission of Secular Women is to amplify the voice, presence, and influence of non-religious women. And our vision is that is basically equal representation. That's how I see my feminism. It's not anything, I'm definitely not militant or radical. I just want, you know, if women want to be a part of something, then we have the right to be 50-50 of it. That's pretty simply how I see it. Um, some of our values, I will admit, are liberal. Um, humanism, we embrace human-centric, I'm reading straight from the thing, so human-centric ethics informed by reason and science, 
We think that all human beings are entitled to freedom of religion, free from other people's ideologies. As far as health and sexuality, we think that everyone should be able to express their gender, how they are comfortable, their sexual orientation. We are all for um, age appropriate, medically accurate, health and sex education. So of course when Todd Aiken and his whole thing about, well anyway, you know about that, that was really frustrating. Um, we oppose all attempts to criminalize abortion and contraception. We think that everybody has the right to feel safe and confident wherever they go without bullying, without emotional torment, um, family and relationships. We are very much for marriage equality. Feminism, um, we hate that religion is used to oppress women and we wanna fight against that. All women have the same basic human rights as everyone else and we ha we're entitled to full and equal participation in government. And one of the things that's really important though is the secular community. We think that diversity only serves to enrich it. So by getting more women involved, by getting more you know, blacks, gays involved, it's only going to enrich it. You know, we're not trying to take anything away from anyone else, we're just trying to add to what's already there. And some of the things we're done, we're in our infancy. This was all about two months ago that we started. Um, we have several awards that we're gonna do. We wanna recognize the people that are working really hard in the, commu the secular community. We have a Man of the Year Award too, so we're not leaving you guys out. And by the way, men can be members. Some of our biggest allies are men. Some of our most vocal feminists are men. So by all means, everybody join and I'll give you the website later. Um, we also, one of the ways that we wanted to show the organizations that are trying to be very pro-woman, we have an anti, do I have that up there? Oh, okay, I'm gonna get to that later. Conference grants. One of the reason that women have noted that they keep, that they're, have lower participation at these conferences is because they can't get there. You know, women were still the primary caregivers too, so we worried about childcare. So one of the things Secular Woman is doing, we are giving grants, so if any of you all are looking to get to a conference, you can't afford it, we have, you sign up and we can help you get there. Travel grants, hotel, lodging, all that kind of stuff. And we are working with Camp Quest, and this, this is kind of a secret, so because it's not all worked out, but we want to increase the um, childcare availability at the conferences too, you know, extend the hours, do different things like that so the parents can go have fun. Um, what else do I have up there? Her Story, a play on history. Um, we are featuring various women from history that maybe don't get as much recognition as some of the guys. And in fact, our, our first one was Marie Curie, and our logo is based off of her, but she was an amazing scientist. Everybody knows she was a physicist. She discovered radium, but hardly anybody ever he hears about the fact that she was an atheist, a very devout atheist. So was her husband. And we want to, so we are focusing on bringing these stories out. Um, strategic partnerships, you know, we realize we're going to need help. There are already established organizations out there. Um, we have recently joined up with the SSA, which is a student group. They have, they've noticed a really big disparity in their gender numbers there. And I know in my local SSA group, there are no females on their board and there are hardly any that show up. So we're trying to find ways to work with them to increase the student, you know, the female students that come. And also there seems to be when, when kids graduate, kids, like I'm so old, um, when kids leave college, there's kind of, they don't really know where to go to. They're like, okay, now there's 10,000 organizations I can join. So we're trying to help them work with those people too. Kind of, you know, that 18, 19, I want to get involved still, but I'm too old for my group, my SSA group, so we'll see. Okay, so yeah, back to, we really want to promote the groups that are doing well with their, you know, addressing the issues that are going on with women. So we establish a registry and groups can provide their anti-harassment policies and we're putting them all online so people can see, you know, there are a lot of women that are really concerned about the safety at conferences. And this is one of the things that a lot of the organizations have felt can kind of show like, hey, we are trying to deal with this. And we want to highlight those organizations. It's not all bad. We want them to have their say. Um, also on the website, you can find things like petitions, a list of local women's groups. We also 
highlight products and services from women. This is another way, you know, we want to promote women in the movement, but you know, we all gotta work. There's a lot of people that like Surly Amy that does a lot for the community by selling her products. So we're, we highlight them, um, graphic designers, any kind of artwork. So any of the ladies that have, you know, things to offer, if you sew, things like that, we'll highlight it on the website. Um, recommended reading, just stuff by, by women that are secular women and about secular women. And we have an all female speakers bureau. And one thing that I love about this is because there are a lot of women that, I love them all, trust me. They're great authors, well-known bloggers, but we tend to see kind of the same people at the conferences. So I want to highlight women that are kind of like me, nervous speakers that, you know, haven't done this a lot, might not have a PhD, but still kind of have that story to tell that maybe we can relate to. But a lot of them still have like a lot of leadership roles that are maybe not top, but they're like assistant executive director or, you know, this person's volunteered a lot and they have something to offer. So our speakers bureau is, it's diverse. We have a trans woman on there and this group, when we say woman, it's anybody that identifies as a woman. So um, also to be more inclusive, we have, we are looking for advisors and we want people that bring these different, you know, aspects to it. Like no one on our board now has child, young children. So we want to bring in a woman that has young children. Like I said, we want a trans woman. Anything we can do to diversify our own group so that when we, you know, try to help other groups, we can have that resource to rely on. Um, also, we want women to write, you know, for us. If you have a perspective, we will post your article. You know, it's, I have an article that's coming out pretty soon about, you know, why I don't regret my abortion. I mean, stuff like that is one in three women have one. We need to be getting these kind of stories out. You can don't see stuff like that. Um, one of our transgender is kind of, ladies is giving kind of a trans 101. One of the things that happened was we all thought that we were all like so liberal and inclusive and we knew so much and we accept everybody, but our website had a couple little things on it that a trans woman pointed out and she's like, no, that's a little weird. And I had seen the same kind of wording on other websites and I was so thankful for her that she corrected the wording because little things like that can keep people away. They, they're thinking, oh, these people don't know what they're doing. They're not really about me. So, I mean, these are the kind of voices that we need to hear. We need to learn about these things even when we think that we're super knowledgeable about that. Okay, so, secular woman is you. So please join or volunteer. That's that little thing. And this is our web presence. Our, the website is secularwoman.org. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook. And that's that. I don't know if, okay. We wanted to see if there were any questions for Bridget that you might want to share. Do you want to come up or you can just stand up and ask? <laughs> I just wasn't ready to get married. I mean, that's what it boiled down to. When I finished college, I actually went to Australia and Africa, and I kind of used that as my reason to not get married because I wasn't ready yet. And by the time I was 22, I was like, I need to figure something out. I don't want to wait tables for the rest of my life. That's what I was doing. So I thought that I would do get some little paralegal job, you know, do something like that, and so I could work part time and still stay home with my family. But I don't know. And my parents, I don't know, they never really cared about it either. They never pushed it. But then when I decided to go, they're like, okay, even though among Jehovah's Witnesses, it actually is looked down upon because what happens, you learn and <laughs> you leave. Like so many people, the same thing that happened with me happens to other people. They get this basic knowledge that everybody else knows, but it totally disproves the Bible. But it's been bittersweet. I've gotten, you know, yeah, I lost my family over it, but I still have hope for them. And I still, you know, 
a lot of people, I was, I was kind of angry at first about that, but I believe the same kind of stuff, and they think that they're doing the right thing, that that's what God wants from them, but, and now I have a job that I love. I help pregnant women with HIV, and I would have never been able to do that if I hadn't gotten this education, so, yes, sir. Yeah, I actually, the internet has been a blessing. Um, there are a lot of groups that have ex shows witnesses, and then they start meetups, you know, kind of like this too. So I've met quite a few, and it's it's intense because they're because it was a very high control group, very cult like. They have a lot of the same issues that other groups have with like sex abuse, and you know, women are mistreated and stuff like that. So. There is like an ex-Jehovah's Witness community, and that's been huge in my recovery, if you want to use that term. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know one thing I do that's... No. <laughs> Not at all. But you know what? Every once in a while, I ring my doorbell when my husband's home <laughs> just to like mess with them <laughs> when I'm coming in. So... Um, and you know what's strange? In all this time, I have never had anyone come to my house. I've always missed them. And I'm so upset about it. Like the other day someone came and I saw the pamphlet on the door and I'm like, I don't know what I would do. Cause I, I know I felt so bad. You know, when I was 12, people would treat us so mean. They would scream yell at us. So I would be nice, but I don't know. And I was very afraid of atheists, very scary people. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. It is a, the memberships are paid. So that's primarily where we get it. It's $20 for non-students, $10 for students. And we also have gotten, because we are not a 501c3 yet, we have had got a few like, you know, $500 donations, stuff like that, but it's, it's difficult. We actually have, we're announcing in a couple of days, I guess I'll give you guys a preview of a fundraising thing that we're doing. In order to celebrate diversity, we have a calendar. It's, I know it's very cliche for a calendar, um, but it's going to feature men, women, and trans, and they are going to be nude <laughs> or partially nude. And some of them are pretty big leaders in the movement. So uh, I guess I can say who it is, but like the head of the SSA is gonna be in it, um, Todd Stiefel from the Stiefel Foundation. Um, Nate Phelps from CFI Canada. He's the son of the Westboro Baptist Church minister. Um, we have like Shelly Seagal from, she's the musician from Australia, Graydon Square. So we have a lot of people that are gonna be in it and we're using that to raise money. And then a lot of other like authors have donated books to help raise money. Like Penn Jillette is donating a bunch of books, Michael Shermer. So we're using little things like that to raise money. Every little bit helps. <laughs> um, yeah, and we, well, we don't have any like affiliates yet, so it's just like the one central organization, but we have members from, a lot of members from Texas. In fact, last night when I went to the Feminist Free Thought Movement, I met a good 10, 15 people that were members, so I was pretty happy about that. But we're represented in all over the world. We have Australian members, Swedish members, Canadian, um, a couple in the Middle East. And part of our mission is to eventually, you know, widen out. And we're gonna start an affiliate program in January because I think, you know, national groups can only do so much. It's really that local kind of grassroots that really makes a big impact. So we do wanna do that. Yes. Recently, you did a uh, text blog post on uh, Emily Has Books. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, growing up, Joe's Witness, I was already kind of an outcast from, you know, the community. Um, also, I was raised, my father was college educated. We had, you know, pretty decent amount of money. I, I got a very good education. And 
a lot of the black kids didn't really accept me because of the way I talk and, you know, my weird religious beliefs. So ever since I was little, I've always gotten the, you know, well, you talk proper or you talk white. And that's meant as an insult. My husband, who is white, is always like, that's not, that's a, what's wrong with talking white? But it's just meant to say that you're different. And for a child, nothing is worse than being different. So I've always tried really hard to, you know, try to relate to everyone and other blacks. And with the black community being so religious, to the worst thing you can be almost as an atheist. It's you're better to come out of prison or be gay or anything other than being an atheist. So even as an adult, I struggle with I want black people to like me. I mean, I know that's that sounds so weird, but it's it's true. So it's very difficult for me to tell black people that I'm an atheist because you, you won't even find statistics, and I've looked for how many black atheists it, there are because we're such a small, okay, you have it? Yes, it is uh, less than 1%. Yeah, it's less than 1%. So, and I'm a black female atheist, minority within a minority within a minority. So there's like three of us. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, exactly. I know, and we all know each other. So, yeah, I have a hard time. It's one of those things that I, you know, kind of curl up in a fetal position. I mean, I think about, like, that's such a little, like a little girl thing to feel. Like, I, you know, I want to be accepted. So, and I've, unless I've gone to an atheist gathering, I've never met another black atheist that was open and I and I'm really doing a disservice to me and all the other black atheists that are in the closet because you know I've met other black atheists we've just never told each other because I think everybody a lot of people kind of just feel like that I'm like oh they're not gonna understand I say I'm non-religious also I work for a pastor I didn't mention that <laughs> so I work for a black um, religious organization which I have I feel weird about that. That's a whole different story. So I don't get a chance to be very open about it because I'm fearful. Hi. I'm fearful of losing my job, things like that. So, yes. I am, uh, Florida is, yeah, an at-will employer. They can, I, I don't think he would be so brazen as to say, I'm firing you because you're an atheist, but with them being at-will, he could just fire me and not give a reason. So I'm. He would have to say, he have to which he wouldn't. All I have to, be, or I'm coming at 801 one day. Oh, you were late. You broke the rules. Bye. So, yeah. And that's, when I became a, the state director for American Atheists, that was a huge concern of mine because you're, one of the things you have to do is be very open, and still I am even now. I'm trying to be out there more, so I don't know. I'm, my husband has been very supportive, and he is all for this, what I'm doing. So if I were to lose my job, you know, I do have that support system in him, and he's, he's been awesome. Yes, in a few years, hopefully. We are, we have filed for our 501c3, so it'll be much easier to raise money at that point. We can get like the big donors who can get, you know, it'll be tax deductible. But until then, it's a little bit more difficult, so. But yeah, we wanna be, I would love to do this full time. I would love to do this. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you. Hope you'll come back again soon. All right. See, you have two in the room now. Yeah. <laughs> two adults anyway. And we're not related. That's huge. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I do. Uh, we are going to wrap up right now, um, but I do want to remind everyone: free thought is not free. So we do have our donation boxes out here. They go for supplies, etc., um, for uh, rent and everything else. Do we have any directors that have any announcements done? Yeah, if, if we can all bust our own chairs, we can get out of here very quickly today and get down to Green Lawn. Yeah, five, yeah, we can get this done in, in five. And uh, Mason will be here for a few minutes selling Sergey Bradley, so 50% of the proceeds will go to Green Lawn. Yeah. Uh, Mason will be here for a few minutes I'm actually going to restate that because I want to make sure everyone heard it. Yes. Um, so we do have, and we did have, Surly Ramix did um, uh, help us out yesterday with. Uh, uh, by, by giving us a lot of the uh, necklaces. 50% uh, of the proceeds will go to next year's, um, next year's Women of Reason um, conference and everything else that we need for that particular group. So please visit Mason and Aries back there as well. So uh, if you can, please give. They're about $20 a piece and donations are welcome. Recovering from Religion has yeah. an announcement. Yeah. yeah, come on up. There we go. Be real quick. Hey, everybody. Tim Brewer. Um, I help out with Recovering from Religion in Dallas, and if you've never heard of us, um, started by a guy named Jerry DeWitt, a former pastor, came out of the Clergy Project. And what we do is we meet, and we have a lot of people come who have never even told other people they're having doubts, never even told other people that they might not believe. And um, we meet a lot of people whose <clears throat> spouses, you know, are kind of keeping them in fear of leaving or uh, their family members and a lot of people who are scared that their whole support system is going to fall out if they kind of uh, come out of the closet. So that's what we're there for. We're there to help and just meet and listen. We meet the third Tuesday of every month, so we're actually going to meet this Tuesday. Um, even if you think you are fully recovered and you think you are, you know, okay and happy in life, it's very, very important that you do come to the meetings because it's important for people to see people who are living happily and enjoying their lives and, you know, having a fulfilling existence without religion. And um, it's very uh, inspiring to hear people's stories as well. So this Tuesday we're at the Dallas Resource Center in the Red Room, free to come. Uh, we're going to be meeting at 7.30, so I hope to see some of you there. Thank you. All right. Anything else from anyone else? Justin. I just wanted to remind people that uh, anybody who wants to grab lunch afterwards, either quickly to go into the parade or, uh, or slowly if you aren't going out of the parade, uh, Tammy and I are going to La Madeline at uh, Forest and Preston. La Madeline at Forest and Preston for those that want to, yeah. Okay, anything else? If not, I'll go ahead and close the gathering. Thank you, we will see you next month.